Good evening, everyone. It's so good to be with you. My name is Kevin Brown from the class of 1992. I'm the vice president of the Columbia University School of Nursing Alumni Association and the chair of the annual fund. On behalf of the reunion planning committee, I'd like to welcome you to nursing the past, present and future, a limitless profession. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone to kindly keep yourself muted while our program is taking place. If you have a question or comment, please utilize the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. We will be hosting breakout sessions towards the latter half of this program. And I hope you're able to join us in small group discussions about goals for the future of nursing. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Dr. Elaine Larson. Dr. Larson is the Anna C. Maxwell Professor Emerita of the Nursing Research and Professor Emerita of Epidemiology at Columbia Nursing. Welcome, Elaine. Thank you and good evening to all. I hope that it's near dinner time for many of you on the East Coast at least and great to see you, but I hope you've got your sparkling water or your wine or whatever so you can relax and enjoy this and not feel like you're gonna starve before 615, mm -hmm. the Eastern Daylight Time. I'm delighted to uh, be joined by five of our fantastic alums, all of whom I know I'm privileged to have worked with. And uh, so I think we're gonna have a wonderful time. I wanna tell you right now to be thinking about what perspective you're interested in, because again, we're gonna have an opportunity at the end for about 20 minutes of a breakout session where you can choose one of the five sessions and you can join one of our speakers and we'll be giving you your assignment, but be thinking as they're speaking about what perspective you'd like to be in the breakout room. Okay, so uh, let's give a start. And first of all, I'm going to, oh, I, I need to tell you that what we are doing here is we're looking at nursing from five different perspectives. So we've got one of the speakers who's, uh, and these are sort of, I mean, they could all speak about everything, but we've given them assignments. So one speaker is on education and nursing workforce. Another one is on health policy and research. Another one is on innovation and entrepreneurship in nursing. Clinical practice is another one. And Global, uh, global emphasis and technology is the fifth one. So I'm gonna now call on each one and ask them to introduce themselves. So I'll start with Jeannie, Jeannie Simiati. Tell us in one minute where you, where you, what you're doing now and what your focus is for this panel. Um, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Jeannie Simiati here, a 2004. You don't have to go that fast. You can okay. <laughs> have more than a minute. 2004 <laughs> graduate of the PhD program at Columbia University with my mentor, Dr. Elaine Larson. Uh, currently, I'm an associate professor at Emory University School of Nursing in Atlanta, Georgia. I also hold an adjunct associate professor position at the University of Pennsylvania. And um, just to top it off, I'm also associate program director of the VA Quality Scholars Program at the Atlanta VA Medical Center. So, um, with almost, it's approaching almost two decades of uh, research as a student and as a professional, uh, my um, interest has been on the nurse workforce and different factors um, <clears throat> within the healthcare organizations um, that um, impact the workforce and how they work in uh, combination together to influence patient outcomes. Um, I can keep going. I have a, a diverse background. Nursing is actually a second, maybe third career. I was originally a high school teacher for 10 years, which is why I have an interest in education as, as well as the workforce. Um, became a paramedic so they could better understand how my students were living um, in Jersey City and in Patterson in New Jersey. And then uh, became a nurse, worked in the PICU, actually at Babies and Children's, uh, right across the street from Columbia. Decided I needed more then a master's, I was trained as a PNP, so walked across the street and met Betty Lentz, who was the dean at the time, introduced me to Elaine Larson, and I think it's all history. Thank you, Jeannie. So think education and nursing workforce with Jeannie. So Katie Cohen. 
Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you to everyone for joining today. Um, I should say that I'm a, a what used to be an ETP graduate, a uh, direct entry program at Columbia, and then I went to do my PhD there as well. I uh, graduated in 2016, and I am now a policy researcher at the RAND Corporation. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's a non-for-profit, nonpartisan think tank. Um, we generate a lot of evidence for policymakers and for foundations. About 50% of RAND's work is for the U.S. military, but we also do education, labor, social and economic well-being, and healthcare, which is the division I mostly work in. Everything from helping inform physician practice reimbursement for CMS to working for the L.A. County Department of Mental Health and generating toolkits for them to help with their services. So very, really wide range, but where my heart is, is improving quality of care, uh, especially among older adults and in the prevention of healthcare associated infections. So I will be adding the perspective today of uh, policy and research for this panel. Thank you, Katie. Now, Phil Gura, did I say it right, Phil? No, it's okay. I brought, okay, <laughs> say it right. Jura. Jura, okay, great. And. Uh, Introduce yourself and tell us what perspective you're representing on the panel. Hi, I'm Philip Jura. I uh, graduated with the, from the FMP program in 2014 and the DMP program in 2016. Um, I am currently, I hold a couple roles, um, chief medical officer, co-owner and co-founder of a company called Your Path. Uh, we're based out of Minneapolis, Minnesota. We're looking at trying to address issues within substance use disorder and trying to fill gaps in care between treatments and maybe pre-treatment and post-treatment and trying to increase access to medications, care, assessments, mental health, and primary care. Um, I'm also owner of the medical practice under your path, which is PJG Medical. My experiences are, revolve a lot around substance use disorder, but also um, HIV and hepatitis, which um, I practiced a lot more when I was working in New York City, but since living in Minnesota, focused mostly um, around access around the, the medication called buprenorphine for opiate use disorder. And I'll be giving the perspective of the innovation in entrepreneurship, so that's me. Thank you, and Edwidge Thomas. Hi, everybody. My name is Edwidge Thomas, if you've heard. Thank you so much uh, for, um, I'm really excited to being part of this panel. Um, so just in terms of my background, I'm trained as an adult nurse practitioner. I completed my master's in my uh, DNP many years ago. I'm a proud member of the first DNP class in 2005. I had the good fortune of living out my dream in every role I've had since graduation. I helped launch uh, the first independent NP practice in the US with uh, Columbia, um, really providing uh, comprehensive primary care to, uh, to our patients and really sort of helping them through their health journey. I've also been a, a faculty member at Columbia as well and also at NYU, at helping to educate uh, our future uh, clinicians. And more recently, my role was with Mount Sinai Hospital. Um, and um, I don't know how many of you know about DISRIP, which is Delivery System Reform Incentive Program. And it's a incentive-based program for, um, for Medicaid to transform the way that we deliver care uh, for Medicaid patients. And it was an $8 billion program that was launched in 2014. And there were 25 networks in the state of New York. And one of the networks was um, affiliated with Mount Sinai. And I was the, the, not only the clinical lead, but also the executive director that uh, led uh, the Mount Sinai network. And the focus really was, again, transforming the way that we deliver care to Medicaid lives by really looking at clinical programs, focusing on patient outcomes, focusing on decreasing um, utilization, avoidable utilization, um, really focused on 300,000 uh, Medicaid lives. So it's been, my journey has been uh, incredible and I always feel completely, um, uh, I'm blessed for all of the experiences I've had. And uh, my role today is gonna be to focus on clinical practice. Thank you. And our last panelist, Olivia Velez. Evening, everyone. My name is Olivia Velez. <laughs> I'm ETP class of 06 and PhD class of 2011. Um, and I was also a Jonas Clinical Nurse Scholar while I was at Columbia. Um, so my current role is a health informatics lead with ICF International. Um, so we're a consulting firm and uh, we receive funding from the U.S. Agency for International Development and the President's 
emergency plan for HIV and AIDS research. Um, and my main role is helping uh, low and middle income countries strengthen their health information systems. Um, though as a nurse, I often get thrown into other jobs as <laughs> I'm sure is familiar to all of us. Um, in addition to that, I'm the co-chair of the Global Digital Health Network, which um, has over 3,900 members representing 117 countries. And it's for um, practitioners of digital health. And I'm the first nurse to hold that position. Um, and I'm also an adjunct professor at the University of Maryland's global campus. And I'm representing global health and technology. Great. Okay, so now you've met our uh, five distinguished folks. And we're going to go back now and ask them in two to three minutes, can you believe this, that they need to sort of summarize the past and the current state of, the, of nursing in their, from their perspective. Now, the reason we're doing this short is because we want to spend the rest of the panel time talking about the future of nursing, which is really what's uh, important, uh, as well as the past. But obviously, we learn from the past and from the, from the present. So, uh, Edwidge, I'm going to let you start with practice, because that's our core. Okay, um, so I believe that nursing practice at its core exemplifies the art of, and science of human caring. So regardless of the nurse's role or setting, the core of what we do is supporting, it's comforting, it's educating, and it's managing our patients through their health journey. So in the earlier years of nursing practice, our role was largely task-oriented with a focus on providing comfort to patients and following doctor's orders. But you know, as education of nurses became more formal and more comprehensive, and the stronger our found ed educational foundation, um, the more responsibly nurses were afforded and the more critical um, and also respected nursing became as members of the healthcare team. When we think about the advancement of medical research and technology and our understanding of disease and etiology, the pathology, diagnosis and management, nursing practice, even at the baccalaureate level, had to have a deeper foundation of anatomy and physiology pathophysiology, pharmacology, in order to manage patients effectively, right? So while not, and this is while not losing sight of the humanistic and caring approach to supporting patients through their health journey. So in the last two decades, nursing practice has really focused on the advanced practice role. It's a role that began with the need to fill the dearth of primary care physicians in order to improve access and quality health care. But the advanced practice role has gone far beyond, far beyond fulfilling uh, primary care roles. You know, now you have APNs could be found in so many different settings, you have med surge units, ER, ICUs, the OR, labor and delivery with our midwives, long-term care facilities, and the list goes on. But the proliferation of APNs specializing in various diseases have expanded the roles and the opportunities for nursing practice beyond what, is imagine what was imaginable years ago. When you think about palliative care, you think about clinical informaticists, occupational health, school-based health, and the list goes on. What continues to be a challenge in uh, nursing practice, and specifically for the advanced practice role, is that um, you know, we still have barriers to practice. Um, you know, as it stands, there are many states, and I think the last count was potentially 29 states, uh, that, um, that are able to practice at uh, full practice authority. Um, which, which means that, you know, nurses, the, the remainder of the states, you have to have a physician relationship or collaboration in order to practice independently. So, you know, when I think about the journey of nursing, we've gone to being so tethered or, or, or I, well, we, we're still tethered to physicians, but not as much as we used to be. When we think about clinical practice today, the advancement that nurses have done, the, what we're able to do and the different settings and the different uh, specializations that you have nursing, nursing practice today, it is far beyond, I think, what any of us could have imagined for those of us who started in nursing many, many years ago. So I am just so excited uh, with the prospect of, you know, what more is to come for nursing. And of course, we're going to talk about that later. But when we think about what we've all lived through with COVID, and we see how nursing was sort of at the forefront. And I think, you know, for, I, I I don't want to say for the, for the first time, but what I recognize in hearing some of my colleagues who are not in healthcare, I think there was really the highlight of or the, the 
it, it crystallized for a lot of folks the criticality of nursing and how nursing is so integral to nursing care and so integral to making sure that patients' outcomes are improved. So I think of, um, of where we are today in terms of uh, uh, nursing care and how far we've come, uh, there's still opportunities for us to go way beyond um, where we are today. So I'm gonna pause there and um, turn it over to my colleagues. Thank you, Edwidge. So Olivia, from your perspective, what's been going on with nursing globally and in terms of technology? Sure. Um, so I think um, one of the interesting uh, webinars I was on with the Glo Global Nursing Caucus, so this isn't my quote, um, but what was said was uh, nurses are the authentic voice of professional caregiving. And that really resonated with me because it talked about how, you know, nurses are the ones that not only spend the most time with patients, but also the most time with their community or with uh, the families or the caregivers. Um, and so that's when I originally went to nursing school coming from the world as a software developer, that's how I saw a nurse. But um, through my time at Columbia and as I've, I've moved in, into my professional field, I've seen, you know, since Florence Nightingale, we've had all these leadership roles, right? And we've, we've taken all these initiatives. And what I'm starting to see now is, is not only do we have these leadership roles, but they're very elevated re leadership roles where um, we have a voice at senior policy tables. And, um, you know, we have nurses in the House of Representatives um, here, here in the U.S. And, you know, we have nurses in, in very important positions at WHO and in country government. Um, so that's kind of where I see, see the future with global health, where we're really setting this policy, which, um, you know, I think is critical, especially during COVID and everything that's happened. The, you know, uh, we're so much more globally connected than we were in the past. Um, and, and it touches into technology too. Like we know how those processes and workflows, we know what the data needs are and, and how to um, get the information we need at the point of care, but also for strengthening the healthcare system. So I think as we see all those things come together, um, nurses really have the opportunity to highlight where weaknesses are in the healthcare system that we need to strengthen in order to, you know, receive global equity and universal health care and all these things that we really want to achieve. Thanks, Olivia. So Philip Jura, are nurses entrepreneurs? I, we've always been innovators, right? To feed off of, of, of my previous, you know, what was previously stated, especially with Ed Weege, is, is that we've always been innovating, right? As nurses, we've been opening the window to let in fresh air. We've been meeting patients emotionally and, and thinking about the family holistically. Um, as far as for like entrepreneurship with, with that innovation, um, we see branches of our colleagues taking the lead on that, right? Midwives, midwives going out and starting their own practices or doing their own things. Um, and, you know, anesthesia, right? The fight that the anesthetic nurses had to go through to get recognized to, you know, to do their thing. Sometimes they're still tied to a hospital, right? But they, you know, in, the, in psych nurse practitioners, right? A lot of my colleagues that went into the psych profile, they, you know, they learned that maybe throwing an LLC behind my name would help, you know, help me, you know, expand things, maybe do things, you know, the way I need to or the way I think they need to happen or maybe just pay my bills and, you know, help me pay off my tuition. You know, there, there's, but I think we've always been kind of, tied to something or a little, or doing one-offs. Um, you know, I, I worked, I worked with one company that was owned by a nurse and it was doing home infusions, right? Like finding that thing that's tied and then trying to spin it up because nurses know how to do it best. Um, and I think in current state, we still see just kind of this thing of, of we, we find this thing that we, we think we can innovate and we think that we can, we can run with, but we're still being held back. You know, when we look at reimbursement rates, nurse practitioners by themselves are still not getting 100% reimbursement. There are still certain services we can't order. We can do them. We can create a company around them, but we can't order them. So I, you know, I think there's still a lot of, of, of just disjointedness with it, but there's a lot of innovation and there are a lot of people trying. Um, and, I, and I think current state, I think what, you know, especially with, 
with what happened in the last year, we're seeing that there needs to be a lot of flexibility. You can't have practices and you can't have medicine that is rigid and structured and, and, and stuck inside of a building. You need them to be able to be flexible, movable and adjustable. And nurses are just keyed up for this type of work. This is what we were built for. This is how we were designed. This is how we were educated. This is the work that we do. You don't work on medicine on a medical floor as a floor nurse and be rigid, right? You need to be flexible. You need to be able to take what comes in. As you know, a family nurse practitioner, you have to be flexible because you don't know what's going to walk in that door. And COVID just put that on a more global scale that we had no idea what was coming in the door, but we had to be flexible to make sure that we got what was, you know, we got the care to the patients and we got done what was needed. So Thank I, you. Well. Great. So Katie, tell us what's been going on with nursing in terms of research and policy. Sure. So from the perspective of research, I'd say that this profession is certainly evolving and it's building uh, in our discipline. When I think about this topic, uh, I think back to someone who spoke at the Academy Health Conference a few years back and had described his research career as being like a wheel that was really hard to get spinning and it just picked up speed over time. He got more and more productive. And I kind of think of nursing as still kind of being a, an early stage investigator in some way. And we've had lots of breakthrough superstars who were able to influence their fields and get a lot of respect in the policy arena. And many of them have had terminal degrees in other disciplines and were kind of chipping away at a lot of the issues, the scope of practice, reimbursement issues in policy, but in terms of their research career, you know, it hasn't been that long that our, our wheel has been spinning within nursing. You know, the, the average PhD graduate in nursing is 13 years older than the average graduate in other disciplines, and that's a lot, that's a significant chunk of time to, uh, you know, lose in terms of getting your own funding and starting to build out study teams that not just get your name and your work recognized widely, but also to help train and mentor that next generation. So I think that we're poised for still a lot of growth and I think we're moving in the right direction there. Um, I also think about you know the ability to get more people like me into RAND and other think tanks and other places that are generating evidence we know is gonna get into the hands of decision makers. And I think, again, we're headed in the right direction there and we'll get to critical mass. Thanks, Katie. So Jeannie, uh, you can end us with this with this uh, question, and that is, what is uh, what's nursing education been like, and what's it like right now? I think of all the if we look at all the aspects of nursing, I think education has changed probably more dramatically. We can look back and at the day when nurses were diploma trained and they spent, you know weeks and months and years in the hospitals and embedded in the hospitals. And actually when I was practicing, still practicing, some of those diploma nurses were the best nurses we had on the units because they lived the life you know, of, of being there day in and day out. And then we evolved and we had associate degrees and the community colleges came in and, and, you know, and we evolved onto the baccalaureate degree, um, which, you know, um, gave us not only clinic expert clinicians, but the theoretical and the, the philosophical underpinnings of, of, of nursing care. And, um, and then we kind of fast forwarded, you know, we had the master's when I was in the master's program was very popular. That was the track you took, you know, you were in the baccalaureate program, you had some clinical experience, you went into your master's program, but then the Institute of Medicine, when they came out with the um, future and nursing report, that kind of changed things because you know, and all of a sudden, here's here are medical, here's a medical group, and they're looking at nursing and to see what you know, what what role is nursing playing now um, in in the delivery of care and the quality of care. And one of those recommendations was um, to increase the number of doctorally prepared nurses. And um, I think that was the impetus to to all of a sudden let's take let's take our baccalaureate trained um, nurses and project them into a doctoral program, whether it be research-based as a PhD or clinically based as a DNP. And um, so now we have nurses that are at the highest level of educational attainment um, possible um, and still um, you know, providing excellent care. Um, 
I'll tell you concerns and there's concerns across the board. People wonder, you know, are we pushing too fast? Are we taking people, are we taking our nurses away from the bedside? Um, and there is evidence to show that new nurses are staying less than five years in the, you know, and I don't necessarily think that's the profession. I think they're dropping out and they're going to graduate school. But um, if we pull them away from the bedside, are we gonna have an issue? Are we now gonna have a little bit of a crisis in acute care because we're taking our, our BSN prepared nurses out and placing them in um, doctorally prepared programs. So you can have that debate on, on both ends. Yes, we need them in primary care because there's a huge primary care shortage in this country, but are we pulling them away from the bedside as we're doing that? When it comes uh, to the workforce, um, I have a lot of concerns about the workforce. You know, over time, and this is before I was even a nurse, it was kind of cyclic. You'd have shortages and then there were too many nurses. And then we'd have another shortage. And I remember when my sister, who's also a nurse graduated, they told her at her graduation at the commencement, well, you probably won't find a job, but you know, it was nice having you here. So I mean, and, but now I think that's over. I think we're gonna see chronic shortages, especially, um, um, you know, in, in acute care, and I fear um, post-COVID, um, I'm very fearful for the nurse workforce, um, whether it be in acute care and primary care. Um, I think there's been a lot of suffering going on on the front lines, and, um, and I, I can't help but think that it's going to have a huge impact on the workforce. Thanks, Jeannie. And that's actually a good segue because you raised some questions that hopefully we can address a little bit more in some of the breakout groups. But the, we've talked a little bit about the past and present of nursing, but I want to focus for the until uh, we're finished about 6.15. Um, I want to focus on the future because that's really what we need to be thinking about for the profession. And all of you kind of mentioned the COVID pandemic that has changed us in many ways. And it's unlikely that any of us are going to go back to exactly the way it used to be. There's gonna be some new normals. There are gonna be some new normals in the way we work, in the way we uh, have our family, uh, the way we raise our, our children, the way we retire, everything. So I'm gonna ask now each of the panelists to focus on the future and make a comment about how you think we could sustain, sustain some of the good things that have come out of the pandemic, like learning different ways to work and maybe spending more time with family, et cetera, and for the profession and how, uh, you know, how we can emerge as a better uh, future for, for the profession and for the people that we serve. So with that, looking toward the future, I'm gonna start with Katie. And again, for each of your perspectives. So Katie, from the perspective of policy and um, research. So yeah, thank you. This is, this is kind of a tricky question, but I know that one way in which I don't really wanna to return to normal is around this attention to the value of nurses. There's a lot of evidence out there on kind of or staffing and how impactful nurses can be at the bedside. And, um, you know, I've gotten the, the sense over the years that, you know, it just falls on deaf ears a lot of the time where people are not, you know, reading, reading uh, papers that were submitted to journals during this pandemic, I couldn't help but think, you know, these people haven't read the nursing literature. They don't, <laughs> it's out there, they haven't read it, and they, you know, think they're reinventing the wheel here. Um, but, you know, over the course of the past year, I've also seen nurses on major news outlets more than in any other years past. And I think that a lot of the voices of nurses are being elevated through social media in ways that they they never have before. And I think that we could keep capitalizing on this as a profession. It's hard to trans translate research that way, but I think getting nurses' voices out there and stories is really helpful um, and, you know, draw some attention to the evidence and the work that's been done um, at the policymaking level is would be really helpful. Um, I'm trying to try and keep this so short, but the, the other thing that's really stuck with me from this past year in my work when I've been talking to administrators of hospitals is how shocked they were when they got a little taste of real supply and demand for nurses. You know, what ec economists call like price elasticity for, <laughs> for nurses. And, you know, the, the physicians who just couldn't believe how much the travel nurses were making, but they still had to hire them. You know, they, they just needed nurses and 
not just any nurse, they, they start to recognize that a nurse is not just a nurse and the skills and experience are, are more nuanced than just like, they can't just interchange nurses. And that's, that's really important for, for the work that we've been doing. And it's really important for getting kind of the story of our, our nurses needs at the bedside, you know, what we need to be successful and to care for our patients. So there's a lot of potential, but I think we, we can keep going in the direction of this content that nurses are kind of already producing on social media. If we can amplify that through our organizations, I think that'd be great. Thank you. And Philip, um, what's going to happen with innovation and entrepreneurs? I think I'd like I'd like to see change in, in the way that things are financed and the way things are talked about. Um, I think COVID put into display how fragile some of the hospital's income is, how if you cut out elective surgeries, how quickly things crumble. And actually, and then on the opposite end for payers, when you cut out elective surgeries, how quickly their checkbook gets bigger. And I, I think there needs to be a conversation with nurses, especially as nurses, as entrepreneurs, but also nurses as workers, as what is their financial role in this? How is it that we can understand our impact, but understand what, how we can be more beneficial, especially as we start to push for more value-based reimbursement on things? And in helping nurses and NPs understand their value in that, that it doesn't, you know, if we can get people to come to the table to talk about value-based care for individuals, it's not tied to a code, it's tied to the deliverable. What's being done for the patient? Just because it doesn't have a code doesn't mean it shouldn't be done. We know what needs to be done. Perfect example, a, a kid was suffering from acute asthma and kept going into the ER over and over and over again. And finally, somebody went to that child's house and discovered that they had old moldy carpet and the insurance company paid 10 grand to have some guy come in and rip it up and put hardwood floors in and the kid stopped coming to the ER. That person that went to the home was a nurse, right? Mm -hmm. how, do we, how do we bend the cost curve on healthcare? And I think it starts with nursing, but with nursing, we have to... We have to push them forward to start thinking like entrepreneurs, to start thinking about what is the money? Where is the money going? Where is it coming? Especially as there was this massive pandemic that killed so many people and impacted so many people, but so many nurses were being laid off. And I don't, you know, this, you know, maybe in New York, it was a little bit different, but around here, people were getting furloughed. We were still questioning whether or not we would have a job. I almost lost my job, you know? And you, know, and you would talk to your colleagues or your, or your friends that don't work in healthcare and they're like, but there's a pandemic. I'm like, yep. Yeah, that's ironic, yeah. You know, but again, let's learn from this. How, you know, it, you know, how can we still be present and still impact and do care and do these things? And, and again, I think this opens up opportunity from an entrepreneurship that there are innovations and things that can be done and moves that can be made and things that can be changed within the value system that really bolster the value that we bring as nurses. And that that can be reimbursed, that can be grown, that can be profitable, and change can be made that way. It's not always about making, you know, it's not about an individual making money, but I think if you can prove that something can be profitable in a certain market, that gets the attention that it's not always just making sure you have a surgeon ready for when there's a broken bone, but maybe get some PT out there to make sure that the kids stretch properly before they go out and do contact sports. Maybe not Thanks. increase your neurologist, but maybe encourage helmet usage. You know, okay. there's, there's things. So Edwidge, what do you see for the future of clinical practice in nursing? So I want to piggyback off of what uh, Philip was sort of referencing. I think with COVID, we've learned quite a bit that how we've had sort of a sort of volume um, driven uh, healthcare, right? So when we saw that, you know, people were not being hospitalized or it was largely COVID or surgeries were not being done, people were not going into their doctor's offices, um, which really put uh, quite a damper on um, revenue for so many clinicians and so many hospitals and so many healthcare organizations. So 
you know, I think that COVID has taught us that, you know, there's other ways to deliver care and we have to sort of think about value more so than volume. And, you know, as we move towards that value-based care, we've got to think about populations and how we're taking care of populations. So I think that with COVID as well, we've also learned that there's a factor that I think as nurses, we all know, because we're, um, as part of our training, we understand that Ooh. social determinants of health uh, impacts care so tremendously. Um, and I think that, um, you know, just a description that uh, Philip with uh, the young man with asthma, you know, multiple visits to the ER. So including the, the, the community-based organizations as part of the care, as part of the model, in order for us to deliver better care to a population. I mean, those are the, those are the um, opportunities I think that COVID um, sort of avails us to really think about how we deliver care. But when I think of nursing in particular, I mean, nursing, you know, a lot of the care that we deliver at nurses, we have to be, um, you know, in person. But telehealth exploded during COVID. And, you know, prior to, tele prior to COVID, I remember we were looking at numbers and trying to encourage more telehealth visits among um, some of our uh, providers at, uh, at Sinai. I mean, we barely had 500 televisits within um, of, um, a month. Uh, within March alone, we went up to 20,000 visits of telehealth, right? So, you know, right now the reimbursement for telehealth is, um, is fairly good. It's similar to um, in-person visits and hopefully, um, you know, regulations doesn't change that much. But we now understand the importance in how we could truly deliver care through telehealth um, in caring for our patients. Uh, and I think that it's, it's served a lot of our NPs and clinicians and nurses well as well, because it really gives one the flexibility to really be able to impact your patients, to be able to have access to your patients, also be able to see their home environment, meet their families in some instances. I mean, these are, these are opportunities that we didn't have as clinicians, really getting to know your patients to a different dimension really helps us to deliver sort of a better um, uh, patient care and potentially will improve their outcomes. So I'm fairly encouraged by what we've learned uh, during our COVID times and how we could sort of leverage what we've learned into really delivering sort of a better population health, more towards value, more towards making uh, the experience for clinicians user-friendly as well, because we do know our nurses um, are, are, are were quite challenged um, during COVID. So I'll pause there. Thank you. So Olivia, the first worldwide health problem that's affected us in this, in this dramatic way. So what's going on globally? Yeah, <clears throat> so I hate to be a bummer, <laughs> but globally the, the picture, it really is not uh, very good. You know, I feel like here in New York, at least we're, we're kind of coming around the curve to brighter days and maybe that's just because it's springtime. Um, you know, but if we look at what's happening in low and middle income countries, things are, are not getting better, right? So um, a colleague of mine from Guatemala recently shared the rate at which they're receiving vaccines um, due to the inequity and in how those are distributed between countries, they're not gonna be able to vaccinate their population for 10 years. Um, or the news out of India is, is horrifying. There are, there are over 20 million cases of COVID in the country. Their healthcare system is completely overwhelmed. Um, so it, it's a little hard to, to kind of dig out what positives are happening. And if you look at even uh, lower income countries, we don't, e we don't even know what's going on, right? Like, so in Kenya, for example, there's very little data about COVID incidents and cases. So you'll just hear anecdotally, the hospitals are full. They don't have equipment, they're sending people away. Um, but it's, it's very hard to capture that information. And at this point, it, it's a little frustrating because I wanna say how many pandemics or epidemics do we need before we figure out we need data, we need information and we need strength in healthcare. Um, Cause we've already gone through this with HIV and Ebola and, and every time we're like, yeah, we gotta put these systems in place and then and they're not there still. Um, so so my, my hope is, you know, now that it's impacted all these high income countries and, and having an ongoing pandemic that's not gonna go away in these lower income countries, maybe we'll say, hey, oh, this time we're really gonna do something. Um, 
to you know strengthen our data and information systems and put the processes in place that make these these countries stronger because globally we need to strengthen healthcare you know covid doesn't care about your border um, and and neither do a lot of other diseases you know so um, you know all these issues are, are really about who we are as a society and a people and I think um, as human beings, right? And I feel like nurses have always been in the forefront of that and recognized that. Um, and so, you know, kind of going back to what I was saying earlier about uh, us needing to be in senior leadership roles and having these voices. So, you know, in 2017, Elizabeth Arrow was um, named chief nursing officer of the World Health Organization. And that was the first time a nurse has had a senior leadership role at the World Health Organization. Meanwhile, if you go to all these countries, it's nurses delivering care. Why did it take so long? <laughs> so, so what I'm hoping is that, that we see more nurses taking these policy positions and taking these leadership roles and really impacting global health and um, how we work together uh, across nations to improve the health of all peoples. Thank you. And, and Jeannie, we already were seeing simulation going like crazy even before uh, these times, but education is certainly going to change. That's for sure. My, my niece is now a student at Columbia in the School of Nursing and living with us. So I get to see from the student's perspective how things are going. I get to hear all about all the good professors and all the professors that she isn't so fond of and all this stuff. But anyway, so what do you think about education? Oh, uh, education, I, I definitely think it will not be what we once considered the norm, um, whether it be undergraduate or graduate. I think you're gonna see more and more of it that's uh, simulation based. Um, if schools aren't already high tech, they'll be moving in that direction. Um, unfortunately, maybe some of the smaller schools won't be able to keep up, you know, won't be competitive enough or have the resources, you know, to sustain that type of, um, of, of environment. I'm sure you have it at the new school, the new building over at Columbia, I'm sure is high tech. We're putting up a whole new building with um, high tech sim in, at Emory uh, that should be completed next year. So I, I think this is, um, um, it's, it's the future, but I'm hoping it doesn't, um, I have to revert back to the workforce, if you, if you don't mind, because I'm, re I'm really concerned about the workforce with COVID. And, um, you know, the social media, the, the, the bedside, the frontline workers I'm, I'm, I'm referring to. And I think, I mean, my heart goes out to them. There's over like, there's more than 3,600 that have died that are recorded. Um, from providing care. And when you look on social media, physicians, nurses, they're all saying that, you know, they're, they're stressed to no end, their faces are all um, marked from band-aids and everything from masks. And a number of them, even physicians would surprise me that said they're leaving after COVID. When COVID's over, they're leaving. And um, I, I, am, I am fearful uh, of what might happen to the nurse workforce, but yet there's one, positive light there. And for those of you who have been in nursing a while, you know, there's this old saying that nurses eat their young. And I think that's going to be a thing of the past. I really think that's going to be a, th a thing of the past, that when the new nurses come in, the senior nurses are going to embrace them because they're going to realize, you know, when our greatest time of need, you stepped up and you helped us, you know, when our lives were at danger, yeah. when our lives were in danger. So, um, yeah, educational change, it'll be high tech. And I think the profession, I'm, I'm hoping we can sustain this uh, pandemic and that we're gonna come out and this will be a profession that's closer and more close knit than has ever been in the past. Thank you, Jeannie, very uh, articulate. So, okay, welcome back. I think there's 34 of us back already. Uh, probably a few more will be coming. So when we get our five, uh, facilitators together. Uh, we'll sort of summarize. So how was it for all of you participants? Anybody want to make any comments about what, what it was like among the participants? Too short. Too short? It was great. Good. Great discussion. Too long, believe me. <laughs> you don't want it to be too long. Yeah. All right. So so uh, now we're just going to have each of you summarize uh, very quickly what your goal was. 
and I'll start with the order in which I see you on my screen. So Edwige, so what we were that practice goal? Yeah, so we were fortunate to have a nurse lawyer on our team. So the very first point <laughs> that came up, which is something that's uh, uh, great for me or special for me is, uh, is really looking at um, full practice authority right, for advanced practice nurses. I mean, we know that there are several states that have full practice authority, but many others do not. Being tethered to physicians uh, in, in being able to provide uh, comprehensive care is, uh, is so problematic. So the, the goal for the future is really to sort of um, um, untether us uh, to, the, to the medical profession. Uh, the second goal that we talked about was um, uh, relating to, again, advanced practice nurses being able to have um, sort of the language to be able to advocate for themselves in terms of um, making the case for uh, why nurse practitioners or why advanced practice nurses are competent to be able to deliver the care that they're, uh, that they're delivering. Because there is a lot of uh, so, so terrible discussions out there with physicians being fairly angry with nurse practitioners sort of um, um, uh, displacing them in many instances and nurse and advanced practice nurses need to be at the ready to have those discussions and really make the case. And the okay. third point, the third goal, I have one more goal. Sorry okay, about we that. got five minutes. So I okay. only had one. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I just wanted to make sure that I covered. All okay, right, I'll quick. stop there. You got, oh. you got 10 seconds. All right, patient navigators. So, um, uh, one of the big concerns is that patients are, are, are being hospitalized and there's so many different people providing that care and patients are not, and patient families are feeling sort of disconnected, not having the information that they need. They need to have somebody to be able to sort of help navigate and explain the care that's being delivered. Got it, thanks. Jeannie, education, okay. workforce. We only had one goal, right? Yeah. Okay, good. I didn't want to, okay. okay. It said at least one, but, uh, she got a bunch in. <laughs> well, we had a, we had some great discussion. What a great group. And I hope I don't do them a disservice with this. But at the end of the day, they brought up something we hadn't mentioned. And that's our nurse educators. And so the goal is to create diverse pathways to prepare and retain nurse educators. Thank you. And succinct also. <clears throat> so, Philip. So we had a smaller group and um, I apologize, but one of, you know, two of us got kind of stuck on a tangent. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to try and come up with a goal that, that maybe kind of helps kind of summarize, but I think it's for the school of nursing going forward, creating resources for people as they go into their profession to come back and help learn the language to help argue for their own profession and helping argue for their value, a place to, kind of get a mini MBA if they can, but also maybe a resource for building that entrepreneurship. But I think it's something that in the doctorate we tried to discuss. I, you know, I went through a management class, but I was not in the headspace to learn a lot of that stuff. Sometimes we fall into these roles later. And how do we then have that language to be able to discuss our value to bring it to the table? Thank you. Katie, policy and research. Right, we, we also had a smaller group, but I think that we got down to something succinct nurses needing to say, I can do this. So if there's a policy that needs to be changed at the, you know, in their institution where they're working to be able to say that I can be the person who can push for better care, or, uh, you know, we don't have an answer to this research question. I need to be the person who can help get this rolling. And we think that should start at an undergraduate level to introduce, you know, nurses to the concept that, you know, if it's not working out, don't accept it, go, <laughs> go make changes. Thank you. And Olivia, global technology. So uh, one of the things we talked about is how COVID has highlighted inequities in our healthcare system and how uh, there's a lot of countries that work with a lot less resource and, just, and have a lot of better outcomes. So how can we learn from lower resource settings to improve equity in our healthcare system? And then, you know, my, my personal agenda that I'm pushing, which is I want to see a nurse as Secretary General of the World Health Organization. So. <laughs> I cannot believe this group. We have two minutes left and everybody <laughs> got to say what they wanted to say. <clears throat> we could have spent an entire day on any one of these topics. So congratulations, guys, this is terrific. And I think Sharon, you're going to summarize for us. 
Yes, I will be creating a summary that will um, be sent to everyone after the fact. Um, but thank you all for joining us tonight. I hope you enjoyed and um, I hope you join us for the rest of our events this week at Reunion. Thank all you. All right. Thank you all for joining us and have a great day. Thank you, my week. panel. Bye. Thank you, bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Awesome.